Um, hi. <laughs> Uh, my dad is Vincent Voltiel. Um, he's going to be talking about belonging matters today. Uh, he was an addict for 37 years. Um, that's what all I know, all me and my sisters knew him as for our whole lives. And then he found Turning Point, went through Turning Point, completely changed it, it, him, him around. Um, and me and my sisters are so proud and ha like happy to see how happy and healthy he is. And we're so grateful for the program and everyone who supports him. Um, yeah, my dad, Vincent Bolfiel. <laughs> Lovely weather, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, I heard the other day, uh, a friend of mine was talking, and, and uh, she was talking about the weather. She said that she woke up in the morning and it was all rainy. I was expecting her to say something really negative. And, but she continued on and said, but at least now I don't have to sleep in it. And uh, for myself, uh, that's where my addiction and my alcoholism took me. Uh, two and a half years ago, I was at times sleeping on the street and uh, basically nobody wanted anything to do with me anymore. I wasn't even allowed in family members' homes or anything. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank Brenda Plant, Turning Point Marty, uh, for inviting me to, to speak here today. It's a real honor and privilege, and I'd like to also thank uh, the minister who just spoke. Uh, that was really encouraging and very, very inspiring. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm here uh, speaking on, on behalf of uh, the Richmond Community Action Team. Uh, over the past year, we had a, a Belonging Matters project where uh, we got together with other street drug users in uh, dialogue sessions and we asked uh, questions such as, uh, what does belonging mean to you? Uh, what do you feel you belong? Uh, when do you feel that you don't belong? What do you think? Uh, and just questions along those lines. And within five or 10 minutes, that group had totally come together. Everybody was comfortable. We were sharing we were like really from the heart situations, what, what it really feels like. And uh, so the, basically out of the group, we came up with our, our goals were to decrease stigma of drug use in Richmond, enhance existing peer support networks in Richmond, and there was another uh, group that was working on collaborating with local housing providers to ensure housing programs are responsive to the needs of people who use drugs. So what I'll do is I'll just give a, a real brief uh, indication of what my life was like and sort of include the Belonging Matters framework along uh, within it. So you get an idea of, of how important this project was and the impact that it has, it's actually already having in our community here in Richmond. At, uh, and it's kind of ironic with Belonging Matters, I was just telling Brenda before this, uh, at, uh, it was probably about 10 years old, 11 years old. I can remember that and, well, 13 is when I started using, but that's the reason why I started using was because I felt I didn't belong. I felt apart, I, you know, separate from, I had a learning disability. Some people would make fun of me, I was bullied. I even had a teacher in an elementary school that called me out in class and called me stupid, things like that. So I had very low self-esteem. I just wanted to be a part of and just take part in events and be like everybody else. So when I started doing uh, drugs, all of a sudden I can remember the first time doing it, I could talk to people, there was no social anxiety, I felt good, I felt, you know, all these, it was like a magic had happened in my life. And I drank alcoholically right from that age of 13, I was addicted right from that age, and I used basically on a daily basis for 37 years. Through that time, I, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how to function without without the use of drugs or alcohol. Um, I managed to function through work. Uh, in my early 20s, I was even a financial broker for a period of time. I was very successful at that. And I became an industrial refrigeration mechanic for 15 years. I was making six figures. I had a wife, three kids. I had two vehicles, motorcycles, vacations. I had absolutely everything. And I can remember my journey, the whole way going through my journey. I, I looked I compare myself to other people. Well, I'm not, not an alcoholic. I, I haven't had a DUI. Then the DUI started to happen. Well, then I had to set the bar lower because I didn't want to admit I had a problem with drugs and alcohol. Well, I haven't lost, you know, I haven't lost my family. I lost my family. Well, you know, I haven't lost my job. I haven't. I, haven't, I just kept setting the bar lower and lower to the point where I lost my housing and I was homeless. And then 
I was only left with myself. I created the mess I was in, and I can remember my dad picking me up. I, would, I, I had enough money to have a hotel room. He picked me up, and I was trying to figure out a way to, to scab him for uh, some money so I could get more alcohol. I wasn't going to get a hotel room, but I, that's what I said to him. I said, you know, can I, I need some money because I can't be homeless or anything like that. And uh, this was the breaking point for me. He looked at me and he said, Vince, we're not going to give you any more money. Every time we give you money, we're killing you. And so I'll either drop you off in a back alley or we'll drop you off somewhere where you can get some help. And uh, this was out in Surrey. I decided, well, Richmond was born, born and raised, so, so drop me off at Richmond Hospital and I'll, I'll get detox. And I went into Richmond Hospital. Now, my previous experiences with the hospital, I've been hospitalized numerous times for alcohol and drug related uh, issues or injuries or, or psychosis. I've been, you know, in, on uh, the third, third or fourth floor, I can't remember, at Richmond Hospital for extended periods of time and things like that. And so my previous experiences, a lot of the time, was I was talked down to, I didn't feel respected, I didn't feel uh, listened to, I was not treated with dignity. And because I was kind of like a, a revolving door in the hospital, the nurses got to know me, and I could sense the judgments coming forward that were placed, placed upon me. And even when I was lying in the bed, they'd be talking directly to me about what was going on with me and alcohol or drugs, and they'd be giving their opinions. You know, if you, if you just stop drinking, you, know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't keep coming back to the hospital. The only emergency room you all know that everybody can hear what's going on. I'd just be sinking. I'd just be sinking, sorry. <laughs> I'd just be sinking into my, uh, you know, into the bed, embarrassed, shamed, uh, just absolutely broken. And um, I would uh, um, just basically leave the hospital before being treated. Uh, I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. I. Uh, but this time when I came into the hospital, I experienced something different. And this comes back to, to our belonging matters. I remember being, I was in the emergency psych ward, I think it was, and uh, a nurse came in on the second day, and she says, she just actually sat down at my bedside, which was kind of, I thought kind of odd. Usually nurses come in, they talk to you, and then they leave. They never sit down. She actually sat down at my bedside, she leaned forward in a real casual position, and she goes, you're, you're having a pretty rough go, aren't you? And I was, oh yeah. And he goes, she said, you know, sometimes talking about it helps. And I was at that point, and she just said the right things. All I don't know, just because I felt she was respecting me, the way she was talking, her body language, her eye contact, I felt that she actually cared and she wanted to hear what I had to say. And I just lost it. I was crying, I was sobbing. Probably a lot of it was unintelligible, <laughs> but she was respectful anyways and listened to me and heard my story. And she says, you know, there's a, a it's called the dark team here in the hospital. And they deal with specifically with this. They can bring you the information that you need, whatever whatever help you want, whatever you think it should look like, they can help you with that way. So I had built the trust with her, and so I decided to say yes to that. The dark team came out and I had the exact same experience. They sat down, explained things to me, and it was just an amazing experience. And uh, through the pamphlets and the information they gave me, I saw one for the uh, Turning Point Doors program. So I called the number, and within two hours, Morgan Malosh, an outreach worker for Turning Point, came out, sat down with me at my bedside, and same thing. She didn't pull out a, a notepad or anything like that. She had, like, no, not clinical at all. She just wanted to get to know me, and we just chatted for like 45 minutes. And uh, she got to know me, and I would, again, I had the trust, and it was the same thing, I was crying and sobbing, and, you know, what have I done with my life? I mean, my family doesn't even want to have anything to do with me. And uh, she goes, well, I'm going to go away based on what you told me. I'm going to come bring back some information tomorrow, and then you can make some decisions from there. She came back the next day, and uh, it was absolutely amazing the way she treated me. It wasn't, you, you need to do this, you have to do this, you know, this kind of approach. She laid out all the information, she made suggestions, she uh, related to what possible outcomes could come from it, and then she allowed me to make the choice on what I wanted to do. And she said, support me in whatever decisions I made. So I made the decision I need to get sober, I need to find housing, I need food, I need, I need some, basically I need to be uh, some support. Uh, she helped me get into the Salvation Army uh, homeless shelter for a few nights until I got into Turning Point. At Turning Point, that was an amazing experience. Uh, the support there, I really felt I, I belonged. And that's what belonging all is, you know, a safe place where you can, you can be vulnerable, you can 
tell your story, you're not going to be judged, you're not going to be criticized, and that's how people really get help, is when you are open to be honest with somebody else, and then that, that's the open door. And uh, so I went through Turning Point, and they gave me all the tools, I took part in in-house pro uh, programs, they encouraged outside programs also, I took part in everything, I just got in the habit of saying yes to whatever was suggested, because you know, my thinking is what got me there. So I thought I'd better rely on somebody else's to get me out of the hole that I had done. Um, so I went through all that, and then a year ago, I was uh, through Vancouver Coastal Health, I was put in contact with the Richmond Community Action Team, and we worked over this past year, putting together a, a program that is a peer-led initiative of how we think, not what, you know, the medical, uh, system thinks, but how here is people with actual experience in drug and alcohol, how we think that we can make an impact, reduce stigma, and this and that. And basically we came up with actually going into the community to uh, healthcare service providers and, and other areas, pharmacists, and actually having conversations with them and telling our stories, our experiences in the hospital, uh, others have had really bad experiences with pharmacies, I'm sure a lot of you out here, especially if with Suboxone and Methadone going in there, and I, I can't imagine you know, being looked down upon, being followed around by security guards and things like that. They forget that we're human beings. We're not, you know, people put this label on us, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm guilty of it too sometimes. And so I was really honored um, through this program. I went in and I did uh, a series of free talks with the Richmond uh, ER nurses. I um, <clears throat> also, just this last week, I spoke um, at the uh, what is it? Uh, orientation meeting for nurses and Richmond RCMP, and I'm getting all these other thing opportunities to share my story. And afterwards, the reception that I'm getting from these these organizations, nurses coming up, and then actually hearing their feedback that you know I'm going to start making more eye contact with people. I'm going to really watch my body language. Because there is a lot of, you know, I was stigmatized, but there's also self, my, my perception of I was being stigmatized too. I would be sitting in a hospital bed and the nurse would be rushing and busy. You know, they're always dealing with people on the, on the worst day in their lives. And they come in and maybe a, a, a blood pressure monitor isn't working. She'd be standing beside me and they, she'd just go, ah, out of frustration. And right away I would take that as, that's me. She's, she's doing this because of me. So I don't put the you know the onus completely on nurses or service care providers or pharmacies or anything like that. I think because of the stigmatization, I just think I'm always being stigmatized. But now through this program, I don't only feel that you know I'm out. I'm doing events like this now and, and doing these spe uh, speeches. I feel more connected not only to the community but to myself too. Like I never used to feel like never mind belonging in the community. I never felt that I belonged to my own body. I, uh, I, I was like completely, you know, separate, and that's why I was trace, chasing the drugs and alcohol was because I, I was chasing that first feeling I initially had, which, of course, never happened again. Um, and uh, it's it's just been an incredible journey, and I can't believe how much my life has changed. Like it, it turn, going through turning point in recovery to one point, and then this belonging matters. I just I. I wish everybody could experience it, and I'm really hoping that through uh, through this and getting out and spreading the word, I'd like to all encourage all of you to to find find your voice, reach out, volunteer in your communities. There's there's an organization called the Community Engagement Advisors Network, and they're always in need of people um, with addiction or alcohol substance use issues to go and speak. Uh, I've spoken at the DGH. I spoke at the River Rock at the Provincial Tra uh, Trauma Forum. Uh, right now, I'm working with BGH and St. Paul's uh, on improving uh, their checklist and discharge plans to reduce return visits for uh, mental health and substance use. And it, you know, it's, it's so empowering. It's something that I used to be ashamed of that brought embarrassment, regret, remorse is now a source of power. It's. I, I don't run away from it anymore. I don't, you know, I don't want anybody knowing I'm an alcoholic. I don't want anybody knowing I'm an addict. Because the more I, I give back, and that's that's the biggest thing for me, is I did so much damage in society to friends, to family, to employers. This is part of me giving back, and also giving back to the recovery community for what it's given to me. Just all of us being here today is 
it creates a sense of belonging and meaning. We're all family. We've all, you know, we're all we're all one. You know, we might have experienced different situations. I was thinking about this also, but it's not the situations that bind us. It's the, for instance, I remember waking up the next uh, the next day after waking up in the drunk tank. I remember waking up and my bags were packed. My kids had left the house and my wife was saying, "Get out." I remember getting a DUI, waking up the next day. And it's not those situations, the feelings attached to those situations, the regret, the remorse, the embarrassment, what have I done? What the hell is wrong with me? Why do I keep doing this? That's what binds us together. Because no matter what the situation we've been to, no matter how low we've gone, those are the feelings that tie us all together, that we can be honest with each other and relate to each other. And that's why, you know, I believe community, recovery community is so important, staying connected. And now what I'm doing, what's empowered me even more, is now taking that and getting connected in the community and make it easier for healthcare providers to approach us and how they should talk to us. Because they go to school to be trained in medicine and they, you know, they uh, learn on all these pieces of equipment. They take x-rays to find out what's wrong with you, blood pressure, blood tests, all these kind of things but they don't have a piece of equipment to find out what's going on in our heads. They don't have a piece of equipment that'll say, this is the history, this is where this person's been. One person shows up with a broken leg and they seem to be okay. Somebody who's experienced physical trauma and has mental health and addictions issues shows up and they're freaking out and they're just going, what the hell, what's wrong with this guy? It's because they don't know what's going on up here and that's what the most important part that they should be focusing on before even physically treating us is their approach. And um, so, I really, I'd also really like to thank Jessie Sutherland. Um, over this past year, she's been a great support, mentor to me. She's the uh, designer and facilitator of the Belonging Matters framework. And I really encourage anybody that's here, uh, if you want to be more involved in Belonging Matters, please speak to her. This is the lady right here with the phone. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, please. She's, uh, she's been amazing. She's been really, She's taken my life to another level. She's given me a voice. This program has given me a voice, and I really, I pray that for everybody here. Um, I've got two tattoos, and I put them on the inside of my arm. One says courage, and one says belief. And whenever I'm down, you know, I look at them. Those are the keys in recovery. To have the courage to ask for help, and believing in yourself, and more important, believing in another person that if you do reach out for help, they're gonna be there and support you. And uh, again, I'd like to thank you all for coming out today, regardless of the weather, and taking the time to, uh, to listen to me, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>